dreadful things done by girls. Throughout the spring of 1893, the streets of Chicago filled with unemployed men from elsewhere, but otherwise the city seemed immune to the nation's financial troubles. Preparations for the fair kept its economy robust, if artificially so. Construction of the Alley L extension to Jackson Park still provided work for hundreds of men. In the company town of Pullman, just south of Chicago, workers labored around the clock to fill backlogged orders for more cars to carry visitors to the fair, though the rate of new orders had fallen off sharply. The Union Stockyards commissioned Burnham's firm to build a new passenger depot at its entrance to manage the expected crush of fairgoers seeking a crimson break from the White City. Downtown, Montgomery Ward installed a new customer's parlor, where excursive fair visitors could loiter on soft couches while browsing the company's 500-page catalog. New hotels rose everywhere. One entrepreneur, Charles Kyler, believed that once his hotel opened, quote, money would be so plentiful it would come a-running uphill to get into our coffers. At Jackson Park, exhibits arrived daily, in ever-mounting volume. There was smoke, clatter, mud, and confusion, as if an army were ma massing for an assault on Chicago. Caravans of Wells Fargo and Adams Express wagons moved slowly through the park, drawn by gigantic horses. Throughout the night, freight trains huffed into the park. Switching locomotives nudged individual boxcars over the skein of temporary tracks to their destinations. Lake freighters disgorged pale wooden crates emblazoned with phrases and strange alphabets. George Ferris's steel arrived on five trains of 30 cars each. The Inman steamship line delivered a full-sized section of one of its ocean liners. Bethlehem Steel brought iron, sorry, brought giant ingots and great slabs of military armor, including a curved plate 17 inches thick meant for the gun turret of the dreadnought Indiana. Great Britain delivered locomotives and ship models, including an exquisite 30-foot replica of Britain's latest warship, Victoria, so detailed that even the links of chain in its handrails were to scale. From Baltimore came a long, dark train that chilled the hearts of the men and women who monitored its passage across the prairie, but delighted the innumerable small boys who raced open-jawed to the rail bed. The train carried weapons made by the Essen works of Fritz Krupp, the German arms baron, including the largest artillery piece until then constructed, capable of firing a one-ton shell with enough force to penetrate three feet of wrought iron plate. The barrel had to be carried on a specially made car consisting of a steel cradle straddling two extra-long flat cars. An ordinary car had eight wheels. This combination had 32. To ensure that the Pennsylvania Railroad's bridges could support the gun's 250,000-pound weight, two Krupp engineers had traveled to America the previous July to inspect the entire route. The gun quickly acquired the nickname Krupp's Baby, although one writer preferred to think of it as Krupp's Pet Monster. A train with a more light-hearted cargo also headed for Chicago, this one leased by Buffalo Bill for his Wild West show. It carried a small army. 100 former U.S. cavalry soldiers, 97 Cheyenne, Kiowa, Pawnee, and Sioux Indians, another 50 Cossacks and Hussars, 180 horses, 18 buffalo, 10 elk, 10 mules, and a dozen other animals. It also carried Phoebe Ann Moses of Tiffin, Ohio, a young woman with a penchant for guns and an excellent sense of distance. Bill called her Annie. The press called her Miss Oakley. At night, the Indians and soldiers played cards. Ships began converging on U.S. ports from all over the world bearing exposition cargoes of the most exotic kind. Sphinxes, mummies, coffee trees, and ostriches. By far the most exotic cargo, however, was human. Alleged cannibals from Dahomey. Laps from Lapland. Syrian horsemen. On March 9th, a steamer named Guildhall set sail for New York from Alexandria, Egypt, carrying 175 bona fide residents of Cairo, recruited by an entrepreneur named George Pangalos to inhabit his street in Cairo in the Midway Plaisance. In the, guide, in the Guildhall's holds, he stashed 20 donkeys, 7 camels, 
and an assortment of monkeys and deadly snakes. His passenger list included one of Egypt's foremost practitioners of the Danse du Ventre, the young and lushly feminine Farida Mazhar, destined to become a legend in America. Pangalos had secured choice ground at the middle of the midway, adjacent to the Ferris wheel. In a Muslim diaspora that included a Persian concession, a Moorish palace, and Sol Bloom's Algerian village, where Bloom had converted the Algerians' premature arrival into a financial windfall. Bloom had been able to open his village as early as August 1892, well before Dedication Day, and within a month had covered his costs and begun reaping a generous profit. The Algerian version of the Danse du Ventre had proven a particularly powerful draw, once people realized the phrase meant belly dance. Rumors spread of half-clad women jiggling away, when in fact the dance was elegant, stylized, and rather ch chaste. The crowds poured in, Bloom said. I had a gold mine. With his usual flair for improvisation, Bloom contributed something else that would forever color America's perception of the Middle East. The Press Club of Chicago invited him to present a preview of the Danse du Ventre to its members. Never one to shun free publicity, Bloom accepted instantly and traveled to the club with a dozen of his dancers. On arrival, however, he learned that all the club had provided for music was a lone pianist who had no idea what kind of piece might accompany such an exotic dance. Bloom thought a moment, hummed a tune, then plinked it out on the keyboard one note at a time. Over the next century, this tune and its variations would be deployed in a succession of mostly cheesy movies, typically as an accompaniment to the sinuous emergence of a cobra from a basket. It would also drive the schoolyard lyric, and they wear no pants in the southern part of France. Bloom regretted his failure to copyright the tune. The royalties would have run into the millions. Sad news arrived from Zanzibar. There would be no pygmies. Lieutenant Schutfeldt was dead, of unclear causes. There was advice, much of it of course from New York. The advice that rankled most came from Ward McAllister, factotum and chief slipperlick to Mrs. William Astor, Empress of New York Society. Appalled by the vision conjured by Chicago's dedication day, of creme and rabble mixing in such a volume and with such indecorous propinquity, McAllister, in a column in the New York World, advised, quote, It is not quantity, but quality, that the society people here want. Hospitality, which includes the whole human race, is not desirable. He urged Chicago hostesses to hire some French chefs to improve their culinary diction. Quote, in these modern days, society cannot get along without French chefs, he wrote. The man who has been accustomed to delicate fillets of beef, terrapin pâté de foie gras, truffled turkey, and things of that sort would not care to sit down to a boiled leg of mutton dinner with turnips. The thing is, McAllister was serious. And there was more. Quote, I should also advise that they do not frappe their wine too much. Let them put the bottle in the tub and be careful to keep the neck free from ice. For, the quantity of wine in the neck of the bottle being small, it will be acted upon by the ice first. In twenty-five minutes from the time of being placed in the tub, it will be in a perfect condition to be served immediately. What I mean by a perfect condition is that when the wine is poured from the bottle, it should contain little flakes of ice. That is a real frappe. To which the Chicago Journal replied, quote, The mayor will not frappe his wine too much. He will frappe it just enough so the guests can blow the foam off the tops of the glasses without a vulgar exhibition of lung and lip power. His ham sandwiches, sinkers, and Irish quail, better known in the Bridgeport vernacular as pig's feet, will be triumphs of the gastronomic art. One Chicago newspaper called McGallister, quote, A mouse-colored ass. Chicago delighted in such repartee, for the most part. On some level, however, McAllister's remarks stung. McAllister was one particularly snooty voice, but it was clear to everyone that he spoke with the sanction of New York's blue bloods. Among Chicago's leading citizens, there was always a deep fear of being second class. No one topped Chicago in terms of business drive and acumen, but within the city's upper echelons, 
echelon, sorry, there was a veiled anxiety that the city in its commercial advance may indeed have failed to cultivate the finer traits of man and woman. The exposition was to be a giant white banner waved in Mrs. Astor's face. With its gorgeous classical buildings packed with art, its clean water and electric lights, and its overstaffed police department, the exposition was Chicago's conscience, the city it wanted to become. Burnham, in particular, embodied this insecurity. Denied admission to Harvard and Yale, in the, quote, right beginning, he had become a self-conscious connoisseur of fine things. He arranged recitals at his home and office and joined the best clubs and collected the best wines and was now leading the greatest non-military campaign in the nation's history. Even so, the social columnists still did not write about his wife's dresses when he and she attended the opera, the way they, they described the knightly couture of Mesdames Palmer, Pullman, and Armour. The fair was to be Burnham's redemption and Chicago's. Outside peoples already concede our material greatness in that we are well nigh supreme in manufactures and commerce, he wrote. They do, however, claim that we are not cultivated and refined to the same extent. To remove this impression, the thought and work of this bureau has been mostly bent from the start. Advice arrived also by the bookful. An author named Adelaide Hollingsworth chose to honor the fair with more than 700 pages of it, which she published early in the year under the title The Columbia Cookbook. Although her book did include compelling recipes for scrapple, ox cheek, and baked calf's head and tips for the preparation of raccoon, possum, snipe, plovers, and blackbirds for blackbird pie, and, quote, how to broil, fricassee, stew, or fry a squirrel, it was much more than just a cookbook. Hollingsworth billed it as an overall guide to helping modern young housewives create a peaceful, optimistic, and sanitary household. The wife was to set the tenor of the day. Quote, the breakfast table should not be a bulletin board for the curing of horrible dreams and depressing symptoms, but the place where a bright keynote of the day is struck. In places, Hollingsworth advice revealed, by refraction, a certain Victorian raciness. In a segment on how best to wash silk underwear, she advised, quote, if the article is black, add a little ammonia instead of acid to the rinsing water. One of the most persistent problems of the day was, quote, offensive feet, caused by the prevailing habit of washing feet only once a week. To combat this, Hollingsworth wrote, Quote, take one part muriatic acid to ten parts of water, rub the feet every night with this mixture before retiring to bed. To rid your mouth of the odor of onions, drink strong coffee. Oysters made the best rat bait. To induce cream to whip, add a grain of salt. To keep milk sweet longer, add horseradish. Hollingsworth offered sage medical advice. Don't sit between a fever patient and a fire, and provided various techniques for dealing with medical emergencies, such as accidental poisoning. Among a list of measures effective for inducing vomiting, she included, quote, injections of tobacco into the anus through a pipe stem. Jacob Reese, the New York journalist who had devoted himself to revealing the squalid housing of America's poor, came to Chicago bearing counsel of a graver sort. In March, he gave a talk at Hull House, a reform settlement founded by Jane Addams, St. Jane. Hull House had become a bastion of progressive thought inhabited by strong-willed young women, interspersed, as one visitor put it, with earnest-faced, self-subordinating and mild-mannered men who slide from room to room apologetically. Clarence Darrow regularly walked the short distance from his office in the rookery to Hull House, where he was admired for his intellect and social empathy, but disparaged privately for his slovenly dress and less-than-exemplary hygiene. At the time of Reese's talk, Reese and Adams were two of the best-known people in America. Reese had toured Chicago's foulest districts and pronounced them worse than anything he had seen in New York. In his talk, he noted the fast approach of the exposition and warned his audience, quote, you ought to begin house cleaning, so to speak, and get your alleys and streets in better condition. 
Never in our worst season have we had so much filth in New York City. In fact, Chicago had been trying to tidy itself up for some time and had found the challenge monumental. The city stepped up its efforts to remove garbage and began repaving alleys and streets. It deployed smoke inspectors to enforce a new anti-smoke ordinance. Newspapers launched crusades against pestilent alleys and excess smoke and identified the worst offenders in print, among them Burnham's newly opened Masonic Temple, which the Chicago Tribune likened to Mount Vesuvius. Carrie Watson, Chicago's foremost madam, decided her own operation merited a little sprucing up. Her place already was luxurious, with a bowling alley where the pins were bottles of chilled champagne, but now she resolved to increase the number of bedrooms and double her staff. She and other brothel owners anticipated a big spike in demand. They would not be disappointed. Nor, apparently, would their clients. Later, a madam named Chicago May recalled the boisterous year of the fair with a cringe. Quote, What dreadful things were done by some of the girls! It always made me sick even to think of them. The mere mention of the details of some of the circuses is unprintable. I think Rome at its worst had nothing on Chicago during those lurid days. The man who helped make Chicago so hospitable to Carrie Watson and Chicago May, as well as to Mickey Finn and bathhouse John Coughlin, and a few thousand other operators of saloons and gambling dens, was Carter Henry Harrison whose four terms as mayor had gone a long way to establish Chicago as a place that tolerated human frailty, even as it nurtured grand ambition. After his failed run for the office in 1891, Harrison had acquired a newspaper, the Chicago Times, and settled into the job of editor. By the end of 1892, however, he had made it clear that he would love to be the, quote, fair mayor, and lead the city through its most glorious time, but insisted that only a clear signal of popular demand could make him actually enter the campaign. He got it. Carter H. Harrison Association sprang up all over town, and now, at the start of 1893, Carter was one of two candidates for the Democratic nomination, the other being Washington Hessing, editor of the powerful German daily Staatszeitung. Every newspaper in the city, other than his own times, opposed Harrison, as did Burnham and most of Chicago's leading citizens. To Burnham and the others, the new Chicago, as symbolized by the white city rising in Jackson Park, required new leadership, certainly not Harrison. The city's legions of working men disagreed. They always had counted Harrison as one of their own. Our Carter, even though he was a plantation-reared Kentucky man who had gone to Yale, spoke fluent French and German, and recited lengthy passages from Shakespeare. He had served four terms. That he should serve a fifth in the year of the fair seemed fitting, and a wave of nostalgia swept the city's wards. Even his opponents recognized that Harrison, despite his privileged roots, made an intensely appealing candidate for the city's lesser tier. He was magnetic, he was able and willing to talk to anyone about anything and had a way of making himself the center of any conversation. Quote, his friends all noticed it, said Joseph Medill, once an ally, but later Harrison's most ardent opponent. Quote, they would laugh or smile about it and called it Carter Harrisonia. Even at 68, Harrison exuded strength and energy, and women generally agreed that he was more handsome now than he had been in his 50s. Widowed twice, he was rumored to be involved with a much younger woman. He had deep blue eyes with large pupils and an unwrinkled face. He attributed his youthful aspect to a heavy dose of morning coffee. His quirks made him endearing. He loved watermelon when it was in season. He ate it at all three meals. He had a passion for shoes, a different pair each day of the week, and for silk underwear. Almost everyone had seen Harrison riding the streets on his white Kentucky mare in his black slouch hat, trailing a plume of cigar smoke. At his campaign talks, he often addressed his remarks to a stuffed eagle that he carried with him as a prop. Medell accused him of nurturing the city's basest instincts, but also called him, quote, the most remarkable man that our city has ever produced. To the astonishment of the city's ruling class, 
78% of the 681 delegates to the Democratic Convention voted for Harrison on the first ballot. The Democratic elite implored the Republicans to come up with a candidate whom they too could support, anything to keep Harrison from returning to office. The Republicans chose Samuel W. Allerton, a rich packer from Prairie Avenue. The biggest and most powerful newspapers formed an explicit combine to back Allerton and undermine Harrison. The ex-mayor encountered their attacks with humor. During a talk before a large group of supporters at the auditorium, Harrison called Allerton, quote, a most admirable pig sticker and pig slaughterer. I admit it, and I don't arraign him because he slaughters the Queen's English. He can't help it. Harrison rapidly gained ground. Patrick Prendergast, the young mad Irish immigrant, took pride in Harrison's renewed popularity and believed his own efforts at promoting the ex-mayor for re-election had had a lot to do with the campaign's new momentum. An idea came to Prendergast. Just when it entered his brain, he could not say, but it was there, and it gave him satisfaction. He had read extensively into law and politics and understood that political machines operated on a first principle of power. If you worked to advance the interests of the machine, the machine paid you back. Harrison was in his debt. This notion came to Prendergast initially as a glimmer, like the first sunlight to strike the Masonic Tower each morning. But now he thought of it a thousand times a day. It was his treasure and made him square his shoulders and raise his chin. When Harrison won, things would change. And Harrison would win. The great upwelling of enthusiasm in the words seemed to assure Harrison's victory. Once elected, Prendergast believed Harrison would offer him an appointment. He would have to. It was the law of the machine, as immutable as the forces that propelled the Chicago Limited across the prairie. Prendergast wanted to be corporation counsel. No more dealing with newsboys who did not know their place. No more walking in the yellow stew that bubbled between pavers. No more having to breathe the awful perfume of mortified horses left in the middle of the street. When Harrison took office, salvation would come to Patrick Prendergast. The idea caused moments of exaltation. Prendergast bought more postcards and sent exuberant notes to the men who soon would be his associates and clubmates, the judges, lawyers, and merchant princes of Chicago. He, of course, sent another card to his good friend Alfred S. Trude, the defense attorney. My dear Mr. Trude, he began, he intended the next word to be, Hallelujah! but certain words gave him trouble. In his fever to write, he plunged ahead. Alleluia, he wrote. The attempt of the Herald gang to prevent the manifestation of the popular will has been checked, and Carter H. Harrison, the popular choice, will be our next mayor. The newspaper trust has been ingloriously sat down upon. What do I know about the candidacy of a Washington Hessing poor fellow? He has the tail end of my sympathy. In his present trouble, I hope it will not overcome him, in the noble newspaper trust. Glory to the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. He rambled on for a few more lines, then closed, quote, Friendship is the true test of character. After all, sincerely, P.E.J. Prendergast. Again, something in the card drew Trude's attention. Many other recipients of Prendergast's cards also took note. Despite the crush of mail each received from his true peers, this being a time when everyone who knew how to write did so and at length. In that glacier of words grinding towards the 20th century, Prendergast's card was a single fragment of mica glinting with lunacy, pleading to be picked up and pocketed. Once again, Trude kept the letter. In April 1893, the citizens of Chicago elected Carter Henry Harrison to his fifth term. In preparation for the fair, he ordered 200 barrels of whiskey to be used by his office in the entertainment of dignitaries. He gave no thought whatsoever to Patrick Eugene Joseph Prendergast. 